What is up, creative monochrome peeps? Welcome back to episode 13 of the Monochrome Podcast. We're super excited, guys. We only have, what, four episodes left? We have a Mm. bonus episode, by the way, so we're super excited about that. But um, (laughs) it has gone by very quickly. Season one has been super fun, but we're not done yet. We've got lots of cool um, interviews coming and salt news segments and listening now and all that good stuff so today we're doing a quick workshop recap we're listening now with caitlin uh we've got a really really cool interview with a close friend of mine that you will want to listen to it's very inspirational and then keith will bring us our creative challenge so uh but before we jump into our workshop recap i want to ask caitlin and keith what are you most looking forward to this summer we're right on the cusp of warm weather and beach vibes and all that good stuff well i'll i will say that i am really looking forward to just being in the sun uh Mm. i enjoy some good vitamin d and my favorite thing to do in the sun is to grill so i'm looking forward to popping out the grill and cooking three or four nights a week making (laughs) all kinds of amazing things that Mm. i'm sorry that you will not get to have, <laughs> Everybody wants to be Keith's friend. He grills in the summer. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes, sir. It's great. Well, I know that Keith and I are actually going to be out on vacation the same week this summer. Wow! And I'm excited for I'll my be vacation. All alone. Yeah, we'll be all alone, <laughs> you and Kaylee. Uh, but yeah, we're actually like doing something for vacation this summer, which is exciting for me. But we're going to Banff National Park in Canada, and it's oh, been a few cool. years in the making, so we're excited. Get to see mountains. I've heard of that, but I don't really know much about it. So that sounds mm. fun. Uh, I'm super excited because um, my girl is my little baby girl is going to be walking soon, so that'll be fun to do some Ooh, fun yeah. things with her walking around. And then uh, me and my uncle, uh, he's got a pair of jet skis, so we always go Whoa. do some fun jet skiing. So we're planning oh, on awesome. uh, heading up mm-hmm. to a lake mm-hmm. and doing that, which. There is no feeling of freedom like being on jet skis. It's just <laughs> unmatched. So super excited about that. You're pretty much flying. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And if you wreck, like worst case scenario, you fall in some water. It's not too bad. Yeah. You know? Just don't hit another oh, boat. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, Keith, workshop recap. What do you got? What did you learn? Give us a quick snapshot of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is one of my favorite ones that I've watched. I feel like I probably say that every single time, but I think <laughs> that just goes to say the the content that we have sure. on our salt university mm. dot com is the best high quality. A lot but of honestly, just yeah. great teachers. Mm-hmm. And this one is collaboration and creative ministry. It was taught by Life Church's Ali Weissman. Yeah, She's yeah. been there now for about eight years and she serves She's had different roles, but now she is leading the content team, the content Mm -hmm. development team. And so she kind of gets into like, how do we define what collaboration is? Because there's a lot of negative connotations that go with that. She says that we tend to always think of collaboration in the extroverted sense, that it means that it's, you know, everybody's out very loud and like throwing Mm -hmm. ideas around and stuff like that. Like round table meetings. Um, the yes, team exactly. Projects but from high school, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yes, all those things we hated. Um, but uh, she she defines collaboration as aligning resources and effort on a shared goal, and so yeah. that mm-hmm. collaboration. Uh, she had she had two really good quotes that I think that everybody listening will benefit from. Uh, Ed Catmull of Creativity Inc. He was, used to work for Pixar. Uh, He said, you must accept that collaboration brings complication. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I think that is where the fear comes in, in collaboration. And then Mm -hmm. Kevin Ely, who actually is at Life Church himself, Mm -hmm. said, if you don't take the time to do it right, you'll have to find the time to do it over. I think Mm. that is a really good point. So (laughs) when we go maverick mode and try to do things on our own, and it does not fit the overall vision and the goal Mm. that we're supposed to share... Here you are back at ground zero again. Mm. So is that a top I think that's really things? good. Um, but kind of breaking it down, she says she gives four main points on how do we collaborate. The first point that she says is we need to show our work. And by doing that, 
you are allowing other people to see that process. You are a people are able to understand what all the moving parts are while also having that eye on what is our shared vision and goal for, for this project. Um, and the second point she points out is, uh, include more voices at the table. Uh, so you need to make a concerted effort pretty much to find, uh, input from all the various people that are helping you work on this because with different people come different perspectives. Also just different personality types have different ways of working and it's great to bring them in. The third thing she says is that we need to champion the vision. And she had shared a story in her podcast about them trying to create a podcast and put it out for life church. And, uh, they did a bad job of communicating, uh, with the leadership about the vision of that podcast. And that when they kind of finished the product and then showed it to them, it was, as she put, she got one of those emails that was, we need to talk, well, <laughs> which she uh-oh. knew. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going back to the drawing board on this. Yeah. Uh, it turned out that they had to start over and collaborate better with the leadership oh, wow. to understand what is the ultimate goal in creating this and what should For it sure. look like. Uh, and the last thing that she says, the fourth point is that we need to be able to measure our success. And oh. she says that you need a scoreboard and a dashboard. A scoreboard is a trackable way to measure your project success. And a dashboard is like an internal, uh, often intangible measure of success, health of the team during the project. And so by doing these two things, you are measuring your success on completing the project and also how well you are functioning and how efficient you are together as a team to churn out that content. So... That was kind of the the main takeaway. I definitely need to go watch this class. I love <laughs> yeah. all of those points. And I can immediately see like in my own work where I'm doing those and then see areas where I'm like, hey, I actually need to think about that. The measurable mm-hmm. success. What am I using to measure if something's successful or not? Sometimes I'm just completing the project and then it's like, all right, move on. Um, <laughs> so yeah. those are great. That's great good. points. I think as a team, we need to watch this just because uh, point number two, we have very different personalities. We're very different people. And so mm-hmm. it's important to remember that sometimes that it's good for us when we all come together and brainstorm and mm-hmm. work on projects. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's great. Totally agree. Thanks for that, Keith. Okay. Coming up next from Caitlin. Caitlin, what have you been listening to? I am jumping on a trend that we've had lately of sharing audiobooks versus more music, <laughs> but I think we've all been diving into books and we have all actually taken an interest a lot lately in psychology and how the brain works and how that works with the spirit. And I know we've got some episodes coming up that we talk about that. Um, but right now I am listening to two different books, doing a tandem read, uh, get out of your head with Jenny Allen and The Untethered Soul by Michael A. Singer. Mm -hmm. Now, Jenny Allen's book is uh, basically a book about your mental health, about the thoughts and how you like, how you take every thought captive, you know, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. It is very much written for Christians and people of faith. Uh, The Untethered Soul, I have not gone as far into that. I do not think it's written specifically for people of faith, uh, but it very much talks about the science of the brain how your thinking works. Like it takes an entire chapter, just talk about defining consciousness and conscious thought. Hmm. Um, But these are both very interesting. Um, But like I said, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we all kind of know that verse or it might sound familiar to us. Take every thought captive. But I go back to the verse before that. Everyone has like a life verse or a verse that's their favorite in the Bible. At least it seems in the Christian world, if we grew up that way, we all have that favorite verse, you know? Um, but mine has always been kind of obscure, uh, but it is, we are human, but we do not wage war as humans do. And I think sometimes we all just need that reminder. And these books have helped me work through that. We, we battle differently in our lives than non Christians do than people who do not keep God as their pillar. Spiritual do. warfare. Yeah, yeah. Spiritual warfare. And a lot of that happens in our minds internally and how we're taking those thoughts captive. Mm-hmm. So these two books are what I have been listening to. They have been great at helping me process things better at reminding myself to think differently and reminding myself that, you know, God is where my mind needs to be a mm-hmm. lot of the time and not on me alone. 
So I yeah. recommend them. I think they're fantastic. Audible is where I have been going to listen to these two, but I'm sure you can get them, you know, paperback as well. I love that. Spiritual warfare is so internal. And so like, it also can be very external, but I think, I feel like it starts internally a lot of times and, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and being fortified there and your mind is so important. It, another good book to read about that, just to give you great perspective on why that's important, uh, is C.S. Lewis's, um, screw tape letters. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. It, yeah. It's so good for like, not necessarily helping you like, Oh, what can I do to think more positively or think about, you know, my life in a more biblical way or to see people as God, but more of a, like, what does it look like when someone is under attack spiritually and how can I like know if that's happening to me and not be deceived? Yeah. So mm-hmm. anyway, I'm guessing Keith has definitely read screw tape letters, right? Uh, yeah. A long time ago. Yeah. I was going to say with all your <laughs> yeah. theology seminary, I was in high school you know, because I thought that was the cool one of the C.S. Lewis books to read. It's <laughs> mm. a good one. I have yet to read it. So I'll take that recommendation it's too. <laughs> it's, it's written don't think of it as a theology book. It, it's really like a, it, it's a, it's like a fictional novel. story. I mean, a, yeah. yeah. It is. So from what I've heard, um, but it, it's got really powerful implications. L acoustics, a leader in audio technology offers cutting edge sound solutions for houses of worship. Their Elisa immersive hyper real sound transports congregations beyond the ordinary with an immersive soundscape, putting everyone inside the message. From cozy to grand scale sanctuaries, L Acoustics tailors sound designs to meet your specific congregation or worship space, ensuring quality meets affordability. With L Acoustics, you'll never have to sacrifice sound quality. Learn more by clicking the link in the show notes. All right, coming up next, we have a really incredible interview uh, with my close friend, Darian Sanders. Um, he's actually the one that introduced me and my wife um, and then married us. <laughs> he's been a huge uh, mentor and friend. Uh, so I'm super excited to have him on the podcast as a special guest. Uh, Luke kind of talks to him and breaks down his story. Uh, it's it's a really interesting story with lots of up and down, so I'm not going to spoil it too much, but just... <laughs> Sit up, listen, and and I hope you're really inspired by hearing his story. Welcome to the Monochrome Podcast. We have um, Darian Sanders here. Super excited to have you, Darian. Man, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Man, I we were just in the pre-record, and you started telling your story, and I was like, okay, stop, stop, stop. Uh, we just let's just record this. This is just too good. <laughs> so I don't want to set you up in any way, Darian. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about kind of calling and, and what happens when we feel like God puts a calling on our lives. So I just sort of want to let you tell your story. And yeah. so give us a little snapshot of kind of where you came from, a little bit of your kind of upbringing uh, in faith and uh, sort of what you're doing today a little bit. Absolutely. Well, I was born and raised in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, I'm one of eight kids. Um, I'm number six. They call me the knee baby. Uh, so I have uh, twins, brother and sister that are younger than me. Uh, so we still consider me the baby. But <laughs> <laughs> all of my siblings did something in music growing up. And so I wanted to be like them. And in the fourth grade, went to a band practice of uh, my siblings in high school, a marching band practice. And I saw the director doing what she did and I got inspired. And so that's what I wanted to do. And so in the fourth grade, went and picked up a trumpet from a garage sale for a hundred bucks and started playing the trumpet. And it took me to uh, play in middle school, high school, and eventually got me a full-time, uh, full ride to University of Kentucky, uh, where I started majoring in music. But leading up to that, I grew up in a household and a family uh, of faith and um, kind of lived in a, in a dual world of uh, legalistic church, but also very liberal church because um, mm. my parents grew up in two different backgrounds. And so just kind of learning the dichotomy of that, but then also um, in middle school, them not making me go to church anymore. And so I was kind of on their faith uh, through middle school. And then when I got to college, some friends of mine uh, were in a Bible study and asked me to join the Bible study. And these friends uh took me to a conference down in Atlanta uh, called Passion Conference, and it rocked my world. So this was in 
uh, January of 2006, went down to uh, this conference, and we would always try to rush to kind of get front row to kind of for worship and all these other things. In this particular session, uh, when we rushed in, we actually wanted to sit at the very, very top of the arena to kind of get a full scope and a full picture of everything that was going on. And First man, off, that's pretty crazy because everybody <laughs> wants to rush down to the front row. So <laughs> you're that guy that's like, no, I want back row. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it was crazy because, I mean, we were like a row or two from the very, very back of the wall of the arena. And so you could you could get a massive aspect and a scope of what it looked like for this generation of hmm. worshipers and, and kids. Honestly, I was one of the kids just to run after Jesus. And so between that and Louis Giglio preaching on Colossians 3.17, man, it, it kind of shifted my world. He was... Um, he was preaching and he used this illustration of a girl uh, making jeans. And she was like, man, I have to, I have to put in God be trust on the logo or I have to put something down the line of like, Jesus is awesome. And he then started break, breaking down. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't yeah. matter where you are, as long as you are giving God glory and knowing who the gift giver is and you're not worshiping the gift, then, then he'll be honored. Uh, and that's what he wants. Um, and so that kind of shifted my world because... And man, in middle school and high school, people would always be speaking to me saying, man, you're going to be a pastor. You're going to be in the church. And I would always be like, no, I don't want to be in the church full time. Like I want to do this and I want to teach band and I want to travel the world and do all these other things and not, not be in the church. But this moment, it shifted my heart and God got a hold of me. And he was like, man, uh, you can do, you can do a lot of different things. And so go back to Kentucky. Um, I start diving into the church, start diving into this Bible study, diving into scripture, and man, God just starts transforming my heart. And in April of 2006 at Palm Sunday, decided to get baptized. And the church asked, uh, they were doing a, a youth choir, um, kind of like a college choir. And they said, hey man, can you sing Oh Happy Day after you get baptized? I was like, absolutely. So got dunked in the water, had, had this whole <laughs> celebration. It was like, it was crazy. And then I got on stage and started um, singing this song. And the pastor came up to me afterwards and was like, hey, we are actually um, doing five services next week for Easter. Could you come back and do this this song? And we want to help celebrate with you um, and use your story. And I was like, sure. So uh, the next week for Easter Sunday, like, and for the Easter weekend, came back and started leading worship. And that was kind of the, the jumpstart that got me into leading worship. And I did that for about two years um, before... Um, I, I met this guy and a friend of mine, and he was like, hey, man, I would really love to walk with you and disciple you. And that moment in that time, he spent two years walking with me every Wednesday. And it was a beautiful thing because he showed me what it was like to disciple somebody and do life with somebody. And that mm. would be the catalyst that then got me into ministry full time. Dude, uh, I love it. Yeah. So, so I, I got to stop real quick because I know this message from Louie very well. Passion, purpose, and designer dream, <laughs> jeans. Uh, it wrecked my world just as much because, right, he, he makes this whole comment that, like, we don't have to be a pastor or a missionary to be the ones that are called to something. We don't have to have this purpose that's, quote, unquote, church-like. It can be in marketplace. It could be kind of anywhere in the world. So I know that message well, and I know uh, if you're listening to this, you got to go look it up. Passion 06, Passion, Purpose, and Designer Genes. So I'm so glad that your life was wrecked as well by that message. Uh, so I can just see yourself. You know, you're, you're here leading worship. Um, but if I, if I know your story a little bit, and this is kind of where we kind of stopped in our pre-record, but you, you now were starting to get sort of requests, hey, can you do National Anthem? Can you sing in other places, right? So kind of yeah. pick that up, Darian. Where did that story land? Yeah, so serving the church, um, I served full time, but I wasn't on staff full time. So I had other jobs around the around the community. So I would sing in nursing homes, sings at sing at children's <laughs> hospitals. I would go to schools and sing, but I was requested a lot to sing the national anthem. And so I started singing the national anthem at basketball games. And there was a particular basketball game, uh, in state rival or in in state rivalry between UK and U of L. Huge game, and I sing the national anthem at the game. And there was a lady sitting in the audience. Uh, her name was Peggy, and she was a manager for New York City for Broadway. And she heard me sing. She went back up to New York and was talking to one of her clients who happened to be Matilda on Broadway at the time. Oh, my god! And gosh. she was like, hey, there's this young black kid. And she started describing me. And Matilda and her mom were like, hey, you're talking about Darian. He leads worship at our church. 
And get out of here. Yeah. And so she was like, hey, can you connect us? Um, and so Peggy contacted me and was like, hey, um, have you ever thought about doing theater? I'm putting on this production this summer, um, a Broadway review called A Grand Night for Singing with the University of Kentucky. And I want to know, how would you consider doing theater? And I was like, well, Peggy, I don't dance. I don't act. I just sing in church. I don't have any training. And she was like, that's perfectly fine. That's okay. Like, you have something that we would love and that I think Broadway would love to see. And so I started this journey with her of musical theater and what that would look like. And it wrecked my world in a different way than Passion Conference wrecked my world because it opened my eyes to this whole new perspective of music and artistry. And so while still serving at the church, um, they asked me to help launch and open up this regional theater company. And I was like, oh my sure. Gosh. And so while I'm doing this and all of these things are going on, I'm just trying to figure out where God is calling me, where God wants me. I really think that he wants me in the church, but I'm loving this newfound uh, exhilarating performance aspect of performing in the theater and on stage. And so I just start praying. I'm like, okay, God, like, where do you want me? What do you want me to do? And I'm like, the desires of my heart is God. I really want to be on Broadway. Can you take me to Broadway? I want to be on Broadway. And so hang on prayers. before. So, whoa. Okay. So hang on. Let's, let's pause right there. <laughs> That's awesome. But before this, when you were saying, Lord, like I want to be on Broadway and that was your prayer really before you even kind of met this Peggy lady, what did you feel like coming out of passion? Had you sort of really clarified for yourself, like what your quote designer genes were, right? As he talks about, like, where was your heart in what you felt like your calling was coming out of passion? Sort of yeah. this, this revigoration of your faith. Where I still knew, I still knew it was music. I just didn't know quite where it was in music, but I knew it had to do with music. I knew that I, I didn't want to be a band director full time. But I also knew I wasn't quite ready to be in the church full time, but I knew I had to do something with music. And so following along that, it's do I record something? Am I going to be a worship pastor? What does it look like and where does it look like I go? And so that's that's where the prayer started coming from. But I just vividly remember being in different services and people coming up to me. And as clear as day, this this. Uh, experience that I had was after one of the services that we had, a lady walked up to me and she said, Hey, I need you to come meet my, my 90 year old mother. And I was like, okay. So I go meet her and she's like, she's blind. She hates the loud noises in church nowadays because church is starting to get darker and louder, but she really wanted to meet you. So I went up to her and I met her and she was like, all I know is that I haven't liked coming to church, but there was something about your voice that mm. made me and allowed me to see Jesus. And I was like, wow okay, like that, that set differently th with me than yeah. anything else that I had done before. And I was like, okay, does this mean that I'm supposed to be in the church full time? Does it mean that I'm supposed to be leading worship? Like, what does it look like and mean? That's incredible. Okay. So let's get back to your story. So you've been praying, um, Lord, is there any way I can get on Broadway, be involved in something <laughs> like that? And the Lord answered your prayer. Take that from there. What does that look like? Yeah, he actually took me to Broadway Christian Church. <laughs> Right there in Lexington, Kentucky. Oh my and gosh. Yeah. It was not Broadway, was New York, Broadway, Kentucky. I love it. Absolutely. Broadway Christian Church in Lexington, Kentucky. So it was it was one of those things that I had to um I had to thank God and say, Man, yes, you answered prayers. Uh, but now I need to be a little bit more specific. <laughs> and so uh it was really it was really cool because um that got me into really thinking about what I wanted to do. So I was full time at Broadway Christian Church as a worship pastor. And I loved it because they still wanted me to serve in the community and want me to be heavily a part of the community. And so this regional theater company that I helped start, they were like, hey, we would love for you to come and audition for these shows. So I started auditioning for the shows and I didn't get in. <laughs> and I was like, well, what do I need to do? And so they said, you need to start taking dance lessons. And I was like, all right, that's cool. So at 30 years old, I go to the Lexington Ballet Company and I start taking a ballet bar class at the age of 30. And the next year I auditioned and I got in the company. And it was one of these things that after doing this show, I went and talked to my wife and we processed a little bit and we were like, hey, let's, let's give this Broadway thing a real shot. So I started to go to New York and auditioning and uh, was in the final callbacks for Hamilton. And my manager asked me, she said, hey, you want to send in the tape for The Lion King? And I was like, 
no, not at all. Like, I'm in the final callbacks for Hamilton. <laughs> Why am I going to audition for Lion King? And she was like, the Broadway world, the arts world doesn't work like the normal working world where you're in the final interviews of a job and you don't have another job that you're looking at. We, you can have multiple job options and get none of them or get all of them. And so I sent in a tape for Lion King. It wasn't my best one. Um, I didn't get a call from Lion King and I didn't get a call from Hamilton. And my wife and I had prayed oh. and said, all right, God, what, what door do you want us to go through? Close the doors that you don't want us to be in. So he shut those doors on theater and he opened the door for me to move to Louisville to be a worship pastor at a church there. And so my wife and wow. I... All right, I, I want to intersect. I want to intersect yeah. here because... There's so much now to talk about. Um, <laughs> I, I know there's more of this story, but essentially, closed doors, you're now like, okay, I thought all this was Broadway. I mean, how, Darren, how many years had you been really praying and leaning into this idea of, since 2006, right, designer passion and purpose, or designer genes, purpose, passion, passion, purpose, and designer genes talk all the way to sort of this no Hamilton, no Lion King. How, how long had that really been? Yeah, till 2016. It was 10 years. Okay, so 10 years. You'd been kind of leaning in. Okay, God's got something bigger for me. God's got something bigger for me. Broadway, Broadway, Broadway. And it's just sort of kind of like closed door. How did you process that? I mean, wh where were you in your faith journey? Kind of, you know, walk us through what, what you were going through in your head during all that. Yeah. Um, honestly, I was a little confused trying to process through okay, God, if you are giving me this calling, if you are asking me to do this, what does this look like and what does this mean? Um, but also, I, I think I just have this um, optimistic look because when I was processing through Scripture and the, the 10 years that I was at this church and the ups and downs and in worship and life, one of the things that, that I started to realize was, man, God had gifted me to do things that other people weren't equipped to do. And... I may be put into places and situations that I may not be quote unquote qualified to do, but as I look, um, he is qualifying me to do those things. And so I was like, all right, like open-handed, God, where do you want us? What do you want us to do? Mm, man, that takes so much humility and confidence in the cross, in my opinion, to sort of say, even though it's not what I want, I'm going to just sort of trust and honor that God has me where I'm supposed to be for a purpose. And I think, you know, this is a similar story that I experienced even before we kind of started salt conference, Darian, which is what I love so much about your story, because I think a lot of people face this where they feel very convinced God in some way, shape or form has called them to something, whether that's, um, quote unquote in the church or out of the church. I think a lot for our audience, it may be in the church, but it just seems like, the doors just aren't opening. It just seems like constant closed door, constant closed door. And I think in some ways for me personally, um, our faith is, is sort of defined more by what we say when mm -hmm. doors are closed than what we say when doors keep opening. I mean, it's kind of easy to follow God when the doors keep opening and the red carpet's rolled out and sort of life is constantly up and to the right. But what we think, what we say, what we pray mm. when doors keep closing, I think says a lot more about our relationship with God than it does when they're all open, right? Very much so. Very much so. So you enter into full-time worship ministry at this point, right? Worship leading yeah. as a vocation and a calling. Walk me through that season. This is 2016. We're still not the current day, which is kind of fun. Yeah. That means there's still more to this story. <laughs> so yeah, so I did that for two years. Um, it was crazy because I, I'd left what was considered a large mega church in Lexington to go to a smaller church of... So I left from like 12,000 people to a church of a little over 200. And it was, mm. it was not in what people's eyes thought I should be doing. Everyone thought I was taking a step back. Um, not everyone. A lot of people thought I was taking a step back. But honestly, like it was, okay, God, where do you want us? What do you want us to do? Like being available. And I think that that's consistently the process that I've been in is trying to make sure that I have a heart of availability. And God's been honoring that availability even when uh, the earthly circumstances and the earthly accolades don't quite follow, meaning I don't have a degree or meaning maybe this person has been doing this longer than me, um, but yet I'm positioned in a, a place of authority over them. And so I did that for two years in Lexington and then this door and opportunity opened in Louisville. So I moved there um, in 2017. And while there, uh, my wife and I, 
decided that Broadway wasn't necessarily done, but we had just figured out that we were going to have a baby, and then we had uh, a baby, so then we moved to Louisville, and she was like, Broadway's not necessarily done. I was like, Broadway's not necessarily done, but the prayer is, okay, God, if you want me to go to Broadway, you have to open the door the same way that you opened the door for the church. Mm. And two years later, my manager called me and said, hey, um, Lion King would love for you to audition for the role of uh, Ensemble Understudying Simba. And I was like, why would they want me? And she was like, well, remember that tape you sent in two years ago? I'm like, that crappy tape? She was Stop. like, yeah, it must not have been that crappy because they want you to come up and audition. And so for me, I was like, all right, like this position that I had in the church um, was great and amazing. The The church actually passed me up on an opportunity to go into a different role and my prayer was like, okay, God, if, if they're passing me up on this opportunity, what does that mean? Is there an opportunity to grow here? Does that mean I need to mm. leave? Does that mean I need to stay? Literally the next day is when my manager called me about Lion King. And so I, it was the anniversary of uh, my wife and I's wedding. And so we drove down to Lexington to have dinner at our favorite steakhouse. And she was like, babe, this is what we've been praying about for two years. And like, you have to go try it. So I flew up to New York, auditioned for the casting team, they said, we love you. Can you come back? Flew up two weeks later, auditioned for the creative team. They were like, we love you. Can you come back? I auditioned two weeks later for the VP of Disney. And they called me the next day and said, hey, we would love to offer you a position in the ensemble understudying Simba. And so in September of 2019, Unbelievable. that's what I did. <laughs> made, it, made a shift. Oh, my goodness. You finally made it to Broadway. So exciting. <laughs> uh, just one sort of technical thing I want to clarify here for someone in our audience that may not know understudy. Can you just give a little bit of context to that? Yeah. So uh, what that is, is that means I have a role in the show all uh, throughout the entire show. So I'm part of the ensemble. So I was part of the elephant coming down the aisle. I was a wildebeest. I was a, uh, a hyena. There was all these different roles in the show that I would do throughout the whole show. However, if the lead character Simba got injured or um, needed to take some time off or had a vacation day, a professional day away, um, I could potentially fill in on that role. So there's a couple different uh, understudies for each character in the show. And so I was just understudying Simba. That's unbelievable. So you didn't just go to Broadway. You came to Broadway as the like second to Simba, the <laughs> like most important character to Lion King. That's unbelievable. <laughs> Oh my goodness. What an incredible story. I, you know, I, I've actually been sort of leaning in a little bit to this concept of what do we do with callings, especially when our callings don't seem to open up doors as often or as fast as we want. Mm. And there's this thought that I've been thinking about a lot. There, there are some callings, Darian, in our lives, they're safe and they're easy and the Lord opens doors, but there are some callings that God gives us that require faith. And I would rather trade a safe calling for a faith calling any day, knowing that that may mean more closed doors, more closed doors. If you look in scripture, um, you know, the very first time that Jesus kind of starts his ministry, he goes into the wilderness, right? And has to face temptation and the enemy faces him with what I would consider maybe one of the most difficult temptations we get. And that is questioning your identity, right? When he says, Hey, if you truly are God, why don't you turn those rocks into bread? And I think even for you, right, in your story, you're dealing with closed door after closed door after closed, closed door. It's not Broadway, New York. It's Broadway, Kentucky. And you're like, what is my identity? Like, is this really what God has for me? I'm just curious, like living out what you've lived in this sort of, you know, 15, 20 year journey here. Um, what do you encourage someone who may find themselves at that Broadway, Kentucky stage mm. where they are like, Oh, I feel like the Lord kind of answered my prayer, but not in the way it was. Like, is this really my calling? Is this really my gift? What, what would you say to encourage our community in that way? Man, a couple different things. One is stay the course. Um, the last thing that he told you, um, be faithful in that and know and understand. Hmm. Man, that's, if, if that's the last thing that you heard from him, that's what he wants you to do until he gives you another assignment. So it may be that you are, the parking top parking lot attendant at the church and he doesn't want you to move forward doing anything else he just wants you to serve in that way because man no one no one can greet somebody in the rain the way that you do when somebody drives in and feels that love if it's man i i need to work full time in this industry 
doing this thing, whether it's a corporation thing, whether it's a church thing, whether you are a manager at a Walmart or a manager at Zara in the mall, <laughs> if he's calling you to do that and that if that's what he's placed on your heart and that's where he's placed your calling, that's what you need to be faithful in. Um, two, I would say, man, there are so many, th so many times that I tell people all the time, yes, God is the provider and he understands and he knows what he's going to give out, but also he provided us with a brain. So we need to do the next thing that we know that we need to do. So as somebody that says, okay, God's called me to be to Broadway. I don't just sit there and twiddle my thumbs and say, okay, he's called me to be to Broadway. He's going to take me to Broadway at some point in time. You have to put action to that. And for me, it was, I needed to take mm. dance lessons. I needed to take acting lessons. I needed to take voice lessons. I have a God-given talent. I understand that. My voice is a God-given talent. The way that I can move is a God-given talent. But he also gave me a brain to then enhance that talent by going to take lessons, by putting in the hard work. I could be a naturally gifted athlete, but if I don't put any time in at the gym, and if I don't eat well, and I, I don't take care of my body, even if I'm the most naturally gifted athlete, guess what? Somebody that's a C athlete could easily pass me by putting in more work than me. And that's the reality with college so as well. Um, and then lastly, I would say, man, man, chase the no. So many of us shortchange ourselves. So many of us um, think that we are, we take ourselves out of the game before we even get in the game. And for me, I say, man, I'm uniquely made. Everybody here is uniquely made. And so because of that, the gifts that I have, the talents that I bring, I'm the only person that can bring that. And my, my friend, when I joined theater, uh, told me something, but it's something that I've been attached to for quite a long time. It's making sure and understanding, man, when I walk into a room, when I do this thing, man, I'm not arrogant by any means, but I'm authorized by God. He's authorized me to be in this position, be in this scene, be in this spot right now to do the things that he's called me to do. And I don't walk into this podcast saying, man, let me tell you about my story and I'm the best thing that this, 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 or I have this figured out and that figured out. But he's, gave me the, he's given me the authority to sit here and say, man, this is my story. This is my journey. Yours is uniquely beautiful to you. And my journey doesn't put me ahead or above somebody else. It's just my journey. And so I can speak on my journey because I have that authority. And you may not have the same path as me, but the end result is always the same. We want to make Jesus famous. And how he does that, it could be because you're a school teacher. It could be because you're a janitor. It could be because you're on Broadway. It could be because you're a star athlete. It could be because you're a CEO of a company. It doesn't matter. The aspect is, is what are we doing to unite the church and all come to the foot of the cross where we all have level playing field? Dude, I love it. Oh, my gosh, Darren. We could go on and on and on uh, for probably hours talking about this because there's so much to unpack in this story. But I hope... Friends of Salt Community, that you know, I hope you're listening to this being encouraged that just because a closed door doesn't mean never. It may just mean not now. You talked about that in your story. Um, but, man, that's awesome. I, I just want to ask, um, so you're the understudy. You kind of feel like you had called your, you know, reached your sort of peak potential. What what came next? Is, is there anything else to this story that I haven't asked you? <laughs> Yeah, I actually got to perform as Simba. We went back to Kentucky. The tour did. It was a beautiful thing. I got to actually debut in Kentucky. And I landed during Akuna Matata. We sang. We did all the things. And we get towards the end of the show. And I'm doing this solo, this dance. And I'm dancing, I'm dancing, I'm dancing. And I tear my meniscus. <gasps> and I have to leave the tour. On your and debut night. On my debut night. I get through the show. Um, I, I finish the show. We finish the city. And... I get x-rays and nothing quite is, is wrong. I mean, something's wrong, but nothing crazy. But then I get an MRI and it shows I tore my meniscus. And so they were like, you can scrape it and you can go right back in in two weeks or we can repair it and you can be out six to nine months. Well, I chose to repair it and be out six to nine months. And that was in January of 2020. Well, in March of 2020, the pandemic hits. Oh and my goodness. I'm covered on workers comp. So I get full salary, benefits, all these things. Whereas the theater world shuts down and people will get laid off and they have unemployment. So like God's provision of taking care of me and my family during the pandemic really came before. And so my questioning of God, why is this happening? Why are you taking me away? Like you took me from Kentucky to Broadway and now all of a sudden taking that away after two months. And he's like, I got you. I got you. And so I was like, all right. So for 18 months, I repaired my knee, I PT'd, I did all these things. And then during the pandemic, um, I got a call and they said, hey, 
Simba that was on the tour, we took to Broadway. Would you care to audition for Simba for the national tour? And I said, sure. So went and auditioned in October, right after the pandemic, we opened uh, the national tour of the Lion King with me as Simba full time. And so that's what I've been oh doing for two and a half gosh. years. <laughs> Dude, what an awesome end of the story. And I love that uh, somewhere in there, uh, what's in my mind is you were praying for Broadway, New York. The Lord brought you to Broadway Church in Kentucky. And then he brought you back to Broadway, New York by way of a debut and maybe in my mind, Broadway, Kentucky, which I, I know it's not that perfect, <laughs> yeah. but what an amazing story. What an amazing sort of finish to this. Um, man, I wish we had more time. Darian, there's so much here. Uh, someone is going to be inspired by this story. They're going to be inspired by what you're doing uh, and the way that I know you and I were talking earlier that you're now... Um, doing a lot of mentoring and discipling of uh, young men in sort of the arts, um, maybe because of that guy that sort of took you under his wing and said, yeah, I want to bring you up. Talk a little bit about kind of how people can connect with you, your heart for, you know, ministry and all that today and kind of how that looks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I I tell people the easiest way is Instagram underscore Darian Sanders underscore Um, reach out, uh, have questions and just want to talk through life. I'm all about it. Um, for me, I love getting plugged into churches. I got ordained um, before I joined uh, the national tour, and part of my ordinations was getting outside the walls of the church, but also making the big C church um, be united and unified. And so one of the things that I do is while I'm on tour in different cities, I go to uh, different churches and get plugged in. So me and castmates go there and attend church Sunday morning, but also knowing that I'm an ordained pastor is uh, ordained worship pastor is, is different for a lot of people because you're not getting a singer that comes into the to the service, but you get a pastor that can help shepherd and lead the church. And so a lot of the friends that I have around the country, it's cool because we go to their cities. I'll stay with the pastors. I'll stay with friends. And then I'll lead worship at the church to give a little bit of reprieve and a little bit of rest for the teams that are going on because you have somebody that you can trust to come in and help shepherd and flock, shepherd your flock. Um, and and steward what they've been given in a good way. And so I love doing that. That's kind of what I do while on tour. And and JT, uh, who works with you, gets to come and do a lot of worship things with me. We did a worship tour last year, and we're doing another one in October this year. So we're going to four different cities in 10 days. And so I'm just excited about that. That's so awesome. Darian, thank you for being here. Thank you for honestly just sharing vulnerably uh, your story and walking us through that journey and um, just excited, man. Excited to see what God does through your story. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I hope you were encouraged by that. Uh, I encourage you to go connect with Darian on socials and that sort of thing. Um, I think we're going to probably see more of him uh, in the SALT community, so super excited about that. If you guys are wanting after an interview like that to like, Hey, how can I dive deeper into what I'm doing into my skill set, and creativity into what God has for me? I want to encourage you. Uh, if you're not already coming to salt, um, come to salt. And then on top mm-hmm. of that, I want to encourage you to come to masterclass. So maybe totally. you're like, Hey, I'm coming to salt. Um, yeah. we have something on the premium premium plus tickets called masterclass And it is really an opportunity for you to go deep um, in a certain topic. So we've got a few topics, but I want to tell you about one specifically. It's with JT Berg, who is a motion designer with 14 years of experience. He's done animation, title design, character animation, logo design, branding, 3D animation. So he he does it all. Um, he is a currently a motion designer at Life Church. So uh, this guy's doing this week in and week out in the church world. Uh, and he is teaching a master class on uh, graphic design and bringing your designs to lice. Life, mm-hmm. excuse me, not lice. We don't want lice. That's bad. <laughs> Stay away from those. But <laughs> designs to life. Um, and the idea is, is to unlock a toolkit to help you start animating Photoshop files and After Effects. So uh, there's a lot that can be a lot of directions to go with that and a lot of power that can come from doing that. And so he's actually going to have you bring um, some work and kind of work on it in the session um, and answer your questions. It's four hours long. So go check that out. I don't want to belabor it too much, but if you go to salt 24com you can kind of learn more about that. We're super excited about that. So uh, anyway, mm-hmm. coming up next, we have a creative challenge with Keith. 
Yes, I'm very excited about this creative challenge because it is something that I actually practice myself. And so I want to pass it on. Um, so I was thinking the other day about the way that I struggle to keep my attention on things. I'm sure <laughs> I'm not the only one within the sound Speaking of this microphone to our audience. that feels that way. Okay. <laughs> it, everybody in their car or in their office right now says, amen. Um, so I did a little bit of digging on some research on whether or not this would be a good idea. And I got to tell you, it is, which is what we're going to talk about is leading meetings or giving out at a meeting fidget toys or play-doh or anything that has like a sensory element to it um, as a way of helping to improve the overall focus and comprehension and decisiveness of your team. You say <laughs> decisiveness, what does that mean? Well, according to some research and the research, it was a professor at the University of Illinois and I don't know how to say his name, but I'm, we're just going to call him Alejandro Yaris. I think Look that might be right. Notes. Get a link in the yes. show notes. Yeah. In the show notes. <laughs> the show Check notes. it out. To the study. Uh, but in his research um, that has uh, been corroborated with other research, um, it pretty much shows that when we are fidgeting with something, when we've got something in our hands that seems like it would be a distracting distraction, what it actually does is it increases the blood flow to the prefrontal cortex, which is the area of the brain that deals with concentration mm -hmm. and decision making. And it stimulates those parts of the brain that we need in order to be very tuned in to whatever is going on. And so it might just be a fun thing to try at your next staff meeting to maybe gather up a couple different things. These things are all cheap. Um, and just hand them out and say, hey guys, we want to try something for this week at staff meeting or in our Zoom meetings or whatever, we, we want you to play with these. We want you to just kind of have them on hand so that you can kind of do an analysis at the end of the week. Check check it out, check see it out. if it helps your team. Share uh, share how it goes, your thoughts on it. If you'll do it again, use the hashtag Salt Creative Challenge as usual. Um, and maybe we'll share kind of what we fidget with during meetings. I don't have anything, but I have thought about getting a Zen garden, which is like oh, the, yeah. little, oh, wow. the little sand, sand gardens. Mm -hmm. um, something about that lately has just seemed very enticing <laughs> to me. So, Soothing. I like it. Yeah, maybe I'll be fidgeting with some sand uh, next, uh, <laughs> next meeting. But thanks for sharing that, Keith. Thank you guys so much for joining us for episode 13. We hope it was encouraging, equipping, and inspiring. Uh, if it was, please go either up or down on your app, whichever you're listening to, and give us a five-star review. It helps a lot to get the podcast out there. Um, it helps us to know how we're doing, and uh, it encourages us. Also, next week... Make sure to join us. We have a really cool interview with John Thurlow, who is very notorious, well-known uh, worship writer and singer. And um, he's he's been in that world and done a great job for a long time. Now he's a, a worship coach. Um, so we're super excited to connect with him and just pick his brain about some worship stuff. Thank you guys so much for being here. And as always, we'll see you again next week. <laughs>